Provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Act. The Helen Park Board of Education has given adequate notice of this meeting by having published the date, time, and place of this meeting in the Home News Tribune, and has posted notice of this meeting at Bartle School, 435 Mansfield Street, Highland Park, New Jersey. Linda, can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Aversa? Here. Ms. Berkowitz? Ms. Bull? Ms. Simarusti? Here. I'm working on it. Mr. Dietz? Here. Mr. Ross? Here. Ms. Sherber? Here. Mr. Sherman? Mr. Wharton? Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and Can I please have a motion for the approval of the June 16th, 2014 regular public and executive session minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. I'm sorry, I do have one correction though. Is um, there any discussion? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, uh, on the personnel items, I, uh, I think it's only noted, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to get onto my computer yet, but I think it was only noted that I abstained on item two, but I actually abstained from items two through six. You know, I, I had written that down, and it just didn't make sense. Uh, I just didn't recall. Right. So I'll make that correction. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on those items? Linda, roll call, please. Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Simarosti? Yes. Mr. Dietz? This is the... June 16th? I was not here. I believe that. you were not there. I'm staying. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Yes. Mr. Wharton? Yes. Linda, were there any communications? Uh, there were uh, a few emails that came through since the uh, last meeting uh, on various topics. I believe all the board members received them. Okay. Um, Mr. Capone is uh, unable, un unable to be here um, this evening, and so there is no superintendent's report. Um, so we'll just move to the board committee's reports and recommendations. Ashley, could we have a curriculum committee report, please? Yes, the curriculum committee did not meet today, but I do have a, an updated report. Um, the staff that have been involved in creating Excuse the... Excuse me, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Were we going to get the technology plan tonight, or was that, is that going to be when we have uh, the superintendent present? I don't know if you just missed that. I'm sorry for interrupting. I haven't seen the technology plan presentation. So my assumption is that we'll, we'll, having, we'll be having it at the next board meeting. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, the staff that have uh, been working on the curriculum have created a very rigorous um, document. The curricular units are both engaging and in a position to prepare the students for the 25th century. Uh, all K-5, ELA, social studies, and math curriculum uh, and the pacing guides have been written and reviewed. All middle school math curriculum and pacing guides have been written and reviewed. Pre-algebra, algebra, algebra two, and pre-calculus curriculum and the pacing guides have been written and reviewed. The geometry is still pending completion. Um, it should be completed by the end of this, anticipated completion at the end of this week. Um, also anticipate uh, completion of sixth, eighth, and 10th grades um, for, for ELA. Uh, that would be at the end of this week too essentially 75 to 80 percent of the way through is how it is reported. Middle school social studies are complete. Um, there is a recommendation on the table that will come to the board once the packages are delivered that the uh, course ch title, uh, title change for one of the courses for, um, from, to global issues from uh, global civics and that will come up before the board at the next appropriate meeting. Uh, the superintendent, at, at the end of this week, the beginning of next week, the superintendent will be provided with all the curriculum so that it can be uh, uh, reviewed by the board and placed on the agenda, at, again, at the next uh, appropriate board meeting. That's the report for today. Okay. Um, are there any questions, comments about curriculum? Um, I will say that uh, we had the discussion about the benchmarks from the last board meeting, um, and I received a... a a response um, regarding that that I will share now. Um, the, the benchmarks are quarterly benchmarks um, and each benchmark addresses multiple standards. This is the information that, that I've been given. Um, so the, 
there are extra quizzes that are um, given in class that are ma not mandatory. Um, some things like the vocabulary quizzes, et cetera, Fontes and Pinnell are not included in the quarterly benchmarks as, as far as it's understood by me. Um, and so there are five questions per benchmark, as I have been told, and there are quarterly benchmarks. So it seems that, the, uh, that there are 20 questions that are being benchmarked, but that each of these benchmarked questions is not a specific separate assessment. Um, so the results from each of these 20 questions will be included in examining student growth over this time. Um, and the clarity in which this was presented to the benchmark writers um, is obviously the, the um, Ms. Callis is going back, uh, has gone back to the benchmark writers and has clarified that so that there's no miscommunications about what the expectations are um, with regard to you know, the teacher's implementation of the benchmarks. Any other questions about curriculum? Jerry, could we have the finance and facilities? Um, yes, actually, um, we, the finance committee did not meet tonight. I have nothing to report. Okay. Is there any questions, comments about any of the items that appeared under finance? Anne, could we have the personnel report, please? The personnel committee did not meet tonight. I um, just want to point out that you can see from both the agenda and the addendum that uh, the district is in the process of staffing up for the fall um, and uh, filling um, empty positions. Okay, any questions on any of those items, comments? Um, I will point out the um, on the agenda, um, there, the interview process for the middle school, high school principal was undertaken, and Mr. Lester uh, recommended uh, Caitlin Brady. This is under number 13. Um, so we very much look forward to her joining us. And some other elementary positions as well. And could you do the policies, even though we don't have anything? The policy committee did not meet tonight. Um, so there is nothing to report. Okay, there are no policies. Okay, at this time, the Highland Park Board of Education welcomes part public participation and reserve this time for your comments. I'd like to make a motion to limit the time of each public comment to three minutes and also limit um, the ability of speakers to cede their time to others um, to go beyond the three minutes. Second. Second. Oh, Linda, could we have a roll call, please? Dan, do the bylaws give you? I think it's a time limitation, as far as I understand. Seating is? I think so. I mean, it would be extending a public comment beyond a, a, a time limit that's set. Do we know that for sure, though? I am. I, I am taking that interpretation that it is a time. Uh, a time. It, it, it is regarding the time that each individual speaker has. Yes. Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Simorosti? No and no. Mr. Dietz? Yes. Mr. Voss? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Kimberly Bevelacqua Crane, HPEA president. Uh, I would just like to note and make the board aware of um, the fact that many of our staff have not received their assignments at this time. The deadline contractually is August 15th, so we are within deadline at the moment, but this has posed um, a lot of concern among our staff. I'm getting emails, I'm getting calls, concerned about um, their placements and who, th where they will be teaching next year. So I'm just making a note of it. This is the longest that we have ever had to wait to get our assignments in since I can remember. Okay, so noted. I'll, I'll definitely follow up with that. Thank you. Thank you.
Nora Krieger, 19 North 6th Avenue. And uh, I've never, I haven't come to any of these meetings in a very, 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 very long time. I have to put my, uh, okay. Um, just to let you know who I am, um, I have two children that went through the school system. I'm a former school board member from way, way back in the day, 1979 to 1982, uh, a period of time when there was a lot of uh, stuff like going on over here. Um, I also want to also let you know that I am a college professor at Bloomfield College and chair of the education division and, the, um, and an early childhood professor. I uh, taught on and off here in Highland Park part time and I ran a nursery school that some of you may know, Pine Grove Cooperative Nursery School in Piscataway, it was in Piscataway, it's now in New Brunswick. And I just wanted, so that you understand. I'm here to talk about something I understand that you may have voted on already, um, which I would like you, if you have voted on it, to reconsider it. It has to do with the English language learners at the primary school. I had a couple of questions, and maybe if you answer my questions, I have nothing to say, if you can answer my questions. Um, I want to know how many, if anybody knows, how many English language learners you have in the kindergarten, in the pre-K, and in the first grade? Does anyone know? That's not information we would necessarily have right off hand. Yeah, the superintendent it should can, have him, but he's not it here. It can be found Maybe I'll have you. to come back and, when he's here. Um, we can certainly get the information that you request. Yeah, and, uh, and my understanding is that the, the English language learners are going to be grouped all together in one classroom, in a kindergarten class, uh, depending on the numbers, of course, one kindergarten class, one first grade, and one pre-K. Is that my, uh, I mean. That's my understanding. That's your understanding, too. And in Bartle as well, correct? Is that a Bartle, too? Okay. Um, how many students do we have in each of the classes? What's the maximum before we start moving them around and start creating new classes um, at Irving for the moment? The, the, you're talking about individual class sizes? Yes. Somewhere in the under 22. Under 22. OK. So here's what I have to say. I think that grouping all the, I know from research, that grouping all the ELL students together like that is bad practice. I don't care how efficient it looks. The PSYOP model, though, that I have to commend Mr. Capone on that. I think it came from him, I assume, or Mr. Soto, whoever does curriculum. The PSYOP model, the sheltered instruction, on the other hand, is a wonderful model. But it's for teaching academic language and content language. So I'm going to just read you a little statement, and I'll come back when he's here and repeat it again. Um, Nora, just be aware that you're... It's very short. Yes, thank you. ELL students should not be placed in separate classrooms for all-day instruction. Placing ELLs in one room with each other will result in the children self-selecting to play with children from their own language group. This is something I have seen done repeatedly, regardless of age. I've taught at all levels, and this self-selection by language group occurs at every level from pre-K, even in college. Isolating ELL students is a mistake. Classes should have a minimum of half ELLs and half native speakers. The results, this results in children mixing and playing with all the language groups. Since the majority of the day's instruction will be in English, it gives the ELL children a chance to try out their newly learned phrases and words. The oral language development is the first step toward literacy in the second language. It facilitates learning to read and write in the second language. English-speaking children are learning to read in a language that they already speak fluently. We are asking ELL children to begin to read in a language when they have not yet mastered hearing and speaking the language. Placing all the ELL children in one room for all-day instruction will not facilitate the English acquisition process. In fact, it will slow it down. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. And just so, just so that you're aware, my understanding is that no, no classroom is going to have more than a 50% um, population of English language learners, but, but I will have the administration verify that for us at the next uh, board meeting. Indeed. OK, 
Okay, seeing as there's no more public comment. Oh. No problem. Hi, this is Melanie McDermott from 330 South Avenue here in Highland Park. And mostly I just wanted some updates, which uh, I don't know if you will be without, without the presence of Mr. Capone, if you will be aware, but um, I first wanted to ask, what is the status of the discussions regarding the schedule for the middle school and high school? There was some discussion about shifting to uh, mixed, the, I forget all the terminology, but there, we, we currently have the daily rotation, and then there's the block, and then there's the mix that Mr. Capone favors. Is that still under discussion for September? No. Okay, so it wouldn't be implemented this year. It would Correct. Still, okay, that's, and then um, what's, uh, I, so I'm glad to hear that we have an a, a assistant principal. What's the plan for the middle school? Um, what's the status of the searching for the new person, and what is going to be um, the sort of timeline? As far as I understand, applications have come in, but no search committee has been selected, and the process has not yet moved forward. So There's we'll, just, we're in the uh, application gathering phase at this point. Okay, so what will be the, the, the who will be the in charge in the, in the fall for middle school? Well, the, the board will look at the August meeting to see whether we can put someone on the agenda for that, for that time, whether there would be the ability to get someone who wouldn't require 60 days um, in, their, in their district, um, or the board would have the option of um, hiring someone from internally, which you know would preempt that, or potentially hire an interim. So I think there are ma many options. Okay, still, still, so open. Okay, um, and may I ask when we can look forward to the technology committee or technology plan presentation that we thought was going to happen tonight? Yeah, sure. I mean, it should be at the next board meeting. Absolutely. Okay, which is in September. Which is in August. In au oh, okay. When a lot of people still in the leave. summer. Yeah, it's still the summer, but a lot, yes. of us, a lot of us will be away. A lot of us are away tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And certainly the technology uh, presentation will be put online for anyone, and any questions that people had could certainly be brought to the board. Is there? Oh, no, no. Ann Gowan, South 2nd Avenue. Um, I just heard some conflicting information from various people, sorry, conflicting information about class sizes uh, anticipated at Bartle next year, and I was wondering if that had been, um, sorry, I can't write and talk at the same time, if that had been uh, figured out yet, if, if we know, is it going to be, are the classes going to be larger than they were this year? Are they going to stay at 22 or below? Class sizes will, uh, the, the number of classes in each subsequent grade level will, will remain the same. And okay. so the only changes would be, you know, changes in enrollment here or there, you know, very small. Okay, fantastic. So that, that rumor going around about one of the grades contracting from six classrooms to five, that's, that's not correct. Well, the, the grade level, like there might be, uh, it, it depends on the cohort of students. Right. So if there's, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but let's say there are five third grade classes, there would be five fourth grade classes next year. Okay. All right. We had heard from some, we had heard some administrators talking about uh, class cohorts being contracted into a smaller number of classrooms, but that is not anticipated to happen. That is not going to happen. Great. Correct. That's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other public comment? Okay. Ashley, could we have a curriculum motion? Oh, sorry. It's one through five. Here. Thank you. Um, a motion to uh, approve. Yeah, we have to Thanks. scroll up, I think, probably. Yeah. Apologies. Proposal to uh, accept curriculum items, uh, curriculum instruction items one through five. Okay, is there a second? Second. Uh. Is there any other discussion on those curriculum items? 
Okay, Linda, did you get the motion and second? Yes, okay. thank you. Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Simarosti? Yes. Mr. Dietz? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Um, Jerry, finance items? Okay. Um, yeah, I just, there's just one correction um, on item number 15. For the amount of that grant, it should be 5,500 and not 8,500. And then with that, I'd like to move items two through 25 on the agenda. Oh, one? Oh, sorry, one. Is there a second? Second. Linda? Uh, actually, is there any discussion on the finance items? Okay, Linda? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Simarosti? Yes. Mr. Dietz? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Anne? Um, there is a correction on item number three um, on the agenda. Um, the um, additional hours um, for the two nurses has been transposed, so um, now the two hours is for um, Cheryl Leifer and the three is for Jenny Major. Um, and uh, with that, I also would like to move items one through uh, 14 and then 15 through 20 on the addendum. Second. Okay. I'd just like to ask that for, if we have the corrections, if there's corrections on this, if we could have them before public comment. That, that even, I mean, they are, you know, minor, but still. No problem. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Linda? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Simarosti? Um, sorry, give me a second here. Um, I'm still having a hard time just kind of wholesale saying yes to personnel stuff when personnel hasn't met in quite <clears throat> some time and I'm not feeling like I have all the information I need to make the decision. So I'm going to say yes on one through three. I'm going to abstain on four. Um, yes on five. And abstain on six. Um, yes on seven through nine. And I'm going to abstain on ten. Uh, yes on eleven through. 14, and I just want to be clear that I'm um, saying yes on 13, the appointment of the um, assistant principal for the middle school, high school, because I think Mr. Lasseter gave us an incredible amount of information in terms of who he checked for references, how many resumes he looked at. He gave us all of the details of his search process, and I want to thank Mr. Lasseter for that. Um, it makes, makes me feel very confident that there was a lot of thought and care put into uh, the search for the assistant principal for the middle and high school. Um, and I'm likewise going to abstain from 15 through 19 on the addendum, all of the appointments of teachers, and um, yes to 20. Thank you. Mr. Dietz? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. There are no policies to move, um, and there is no president's report. Um, and so, is there any old business? Uh, well, I can ever update everybody on uh, the Senate and Assembly bills that we've been kind of tracking as they go through. The State House, um, the ultimate outcome at this point is that um, the Senate never did vote on the bill. Um, it came up for a vote, I think, two separate times and was threatened to come up for a vote for a third time. Um, all the while, there were lots of negotiations going on in the background between the governor, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, the NJEA. I think those might have been the only three parters. There may have been others. Um, and eventually, I think it was last week, um, Governor Christie came out with an executive order um, that uh, somewhat dealt with some of the issues, somewhat did not. Um, so teacher evaluations will still be impacted by PARC next year, just not to the same extent. So the, um, the percentage has been decreased to 10% um, for um, student test scores. 
which some people are happy with the compromise, some are not. Um, and there will still be a commission appointed, although I think the scope of the commission is um, narrowed and the time frame is also narrowed. Um, and the governor himself appoints the members of the, um, the commission. So I think there are some pieces there that people will certainly still push back against. And if there's, you know, if there's anything for us to do at the board level or community level, I'll certainly keep people posted. Great, thank you, Darcy. Is there any other old business? Is there any new business? Okay, the Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. for the uh, swivel chairs no, for swivel this chairs. side of the table, please. Hi, Rob Magaziner. I'm, uh, I live on Benner Street, 127 Benner Street in Highland Park. Uh, just a quick question, and this is, I guess, a clarification on number 10 uh, personnel with regard to Mr. Soto's um, salary. Was this a contracted increase, Dan? contracted increase uh, for Mr. Soto, or was this something new or different that uh, has just come up? The increase for Mr. Soto was based on um, both the parity with regard to um, the high school principal position um, and commensurate with Mr. Soto's work in the district, um, in, the, in the district office. The anticipation is also that with the change in the curriculum position that Mr. Soto will be taking on additional responsibilities um, in that regard as well. Tell me about that, the, the change. So, um, you know, I don't have exactly all the details about the operation of the district, but um, Ms. Callis, in addition to just the curriculum and instruction, was doing other duties with regard to um, principal uh, oversight with regard to uh, teacher evaluation and those sorts of things. And so more of that gets rolled into Mr. Soto's uh, responsibilities. So with, again, was this a plan change that, that uh, when you all went through your, um, went through the budgeting process, was this something that you were planning at that time or no? I don't think his exact salary was, was planned, no. So it was planned to be the previous amount? Was the previous amount was the amount that was budgeted, and that was the amount that was planned. I don't have exact details about the the way that the central office was 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 budgeted. All right. And then I, the only other thing I have is, at the last meeting, um, most everybody was here, right? I found the interaction that took place between the superintendent and one of the board members and a member of the public to be very, very uncomfortable. And I'm wondering whether there has been any discussion about that interaction. Certainly discussions between the board and the superintendent um, are confidential, um, but the, the board was you know, present at that meeting as well. And so um, discussions occurred and, and the content of those discussions will remain between the board and the superintendent. And do you think it was so, was, it, was that okay? Was that something that was uncomfortable for you, you guys? For, as, a, as a group? I'm not sure that that's a question that the board's going to answer. Well, it's a question I'm asking. Maybe you can, you can maybe ask individual else. board members after, after the, the meeting if you'd like to get individual opinions. But, um, With regard to public comment, this is questions re regarded, you know, related to the board, so. Okay, so it, it was something that has been discussed. It is something that is in the, the discussion with the board and the superintendent regarding uh, decorum at, at all levels, certainly. It, it is ongoing? It's an ongoing discussion? It is. It will always be with any administrator but at the board table. Specifically regarding that interaction? As I said, you know, we, we have had conversations. The specific content of those conversations will be kept between the board and the superintendent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Hi, Jenny Chapman, 123 Magnolia Street. Sorry. 
I'm sorry, Dan, I know that you kind of already explained this, but could you just explain for me again how the benchmarks will work, that, that they are not mandatory, is that right? No, there are, from what I understand, and this is the information that I was given, there are four quarterly benchmarks that are required. Of those four quarterly benchmarks, there are five questions on each benchmark that are, uh, you know, the results that are standards aligned, the results of which will be um, monitored to, to look at student progress. So okay. my understanding is that that means that those, you know, that each individual question is not, each individual question is benchmarked, right? As in the progress is monitored throughout I the see. year, okay. but that each individual uh, question is not its own assessment that would take, let's say, an entire class period. Okay, and does this affect all of the departments or all of the schools, or uh, how does this, how does it work? That's a good question. It's math and English language arts, and... Math and, and language arts? At math, math and, and ELA. Okay. And I think this is specific to English language arts, as far as I understand. This is about writing prompts and um, uh, ELA questions. So it could affect all four schools, all, it, I mean essentially. It could affect first graders, for example. What, what, I, what I take, what I was given, what I, you know, the information that I have is that this is specific to the middle and high school. Oh, um, I see. Okay. It, might, it might be specific to Bartle School as well. I'm not sure exactly. That hasn't been ironed out yet. Or it, it, you don't know it, yet. I don't have the answer to that for okay. sure. So I don't want to say for sure that it is one way or the other. All right. Thank you. Yep. So, so can we get an administrative update on that at the at the next meeting? Yes, sure? absolutely. I'll put that in. Virginia Lofton, 303 South 2nd Avenue. Um, uh, Ashley was talking about the curriculum the writing of the curriculum, and I just have a question. Is that something that has to be rewritten every year? No. So is it rewritten this year um, for a specific reason to comply with uh, some? Yeah, so there's, there's sort of two parts, right? The, there's the Common Core, um, and that, that uh, requires, so for CUSAC, which is the monitoring um, that happens of school districts periodically, um, all uh, curriculum must be aligned to the current New Jersey core content standards. And so the common core standards are in place for math and, language, and English language arts. And there was not, the, the current, the existing curriculum was not aligned to those standards. And so, um, existing, I'm sorry, what? Was not aligned to those existing standards. What? Curriculum. Curriculum, okay. Okay. Um, but theoretically, it, it won't have to be uh, upgraded. I mean, it, it will always be, you know, it's always in process, but it won't have to be rewritten in this sort of whole-scale way um, for a number of years. Okay, thanks. Yep. Is there any other public comment? Hi, Ellen Leibowitz, 250 Grant Ave. Um, as always, thanks for your work as board members. Uh, just a couple of quick things. I um, was really glad to hear the update on the middle school, high school assistant principal search. And Darcy mentioned that you had a lot of information and details, and that is very refreshing. It sounds like the process was um, it was was better um, handled, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, I was just wondering if there's an update on um, the discussions about looking at the search processes in general and what's happening with that. Um, the superintendent um, spoke with um, the board attorney about some items and um, you know I think I said this at the last meeting that, it, that for me it's not that the process um, really is too problematic. Um, what we have here is we have some sort of vetting, you know, that should be done by central office staff, um, and then those candidates could be should be interviewed by a large swath of people, um, and then you know moved forward in the process. 
So as far as I as far as I understand, that that process is you know a process that's followed in small districts and and that sort of thing. And um, I think that you know with regard to the last matter that this came up as as a problem with, um, it wasn't the process per se. It was more um, the decision to move forward with the particular candidate in question. Well, I beg to differ. But my understanding was that a committee was going to be formed to look at the process. That was what was mentioned at previous meetings. So that's really what I was asking about. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with the superintendent Thank about you. that. Um, also, um, I guess Rob asked a um, budgetary question. And I'm, um, I forget what the specific thing was, Dan. But if you're not sure of the answer, your uh, business administrator is right there. So maybe you can. Um, turn to her and ask her for the information so you can provide the, um, the answer to the question from the public. Um, the other thing was um, I appreciate the care that Darcy took with the voting on the personnel issues. That's, it was very refreshing. Um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, to look at each thing individually. That's great. Um, lastly, um, this whole business of limiting public comment time, um, I must say I find rather undemocratic and unfriendly. Um, people take the time to come out to the meetings. They have concerns. They have questions. Um, I don't really understand this new policy that you guys have put forth. Um, it seems, um, you know, almost obnoxious and like, you know, it just like I said, very unfriendly and unnecessary. Most people get up here, they have, they have real serious concerns, questions. Most people don't take advantage of the time. And I see no reason for this um, policy. Thank you. Thank you. And Dan, I do want to follow up on what Ellen said about the committee. I, I mean, I. Last I remember, it felt like, from my perspective anyway, I think there was a lot of interest even at the, from the board table to take a look at that process and different pieces of it. So I'm, I'm a little surprised by your Well, I'm going to, and I'll, I'll follow up with Tim, as I said to Ellen. And I have to say, I think that with regard to limiting public comment, you know, a very, very large majority of school boards, borough councils, town councils, those kinds of things, they do limit public comment to a reasonable amount of time. Um, so I think that that's in following um, with, you know, a, a large majority of public boards. Mm. But, I mean, Dan, you and I have spoken about this as well. I think there was, the school boards actually put out a study on this re relatively recently, and I could, I'd certainly be more than happy to go back and take a look at it. I think what that showed was, well, I don't remember the exact percentages, but while there were boards that do um, limit public comment, I believe, and again, I'll go back and check it, the majority of them, if they did limit time, limited it to five, not to three minutes. I think there's a lot of variety within there, certainly. Oh, well, there were specific I've, spoken, numbers, so I, I will mean, go back and look right. at those specific numbers. Absolutely. Agreed. My name is Allison Salerno. I live at 66 Grant. Um, I had spoken to the board a couple meetings ago about a memo from a county superintendent, another part of the state, from the state DOE, saying that children who opt out or refuse standardized tests, the, the expectation of the Board of Ed is that those children not be forced to sit and stare, as my child was forced. and some other kids in the district. Um, Mr. Ross, you said that you were in conversation with the state about this. What Can you give us an update? Is there an update? The only update is that the I, I spoke with, um, we spoke with the, I, I don't know exactly what their titles were, okay. the, the person that wrote that memo and, and the person above that person, the director of assessment, 
um, we were told basically that students are not allowed to opt out as of now, and that there's a there's a you know what what basically what my response I think last time was to you was that we're awaiting better clarification so that we make sure that our policies are actually in line with the real regulations and not with a, an email that was sent um, you know from someone. Okay, um, I, if I may, um, parents you know, have the right to opt out their kid. They're doing it all over the state. So whether it's allowed or not, it's kind of, um, my perspective is that it would be the parent's prerogative, not a superintendent or a or school district's prerogative to make that decision for the child. Um, that's a decision we made within our family. The specific issue I'm asking you about is when the child, which, which is what the memo addressed, and um, there, and I can provide you with the names of people to follow up with if you don't have them. The, the state was very explicit that they do not want children who refuse the test to then, when it's become clear and there was advance notice, et cetera, et cetera, to then be forced to sit and stare during makeup days. That's what I'm specifically asking you about. The expectation from the Department of Education at the state level is that they don't want that happening. And it seems that this district has chosen to take what my, my experience for my child was the most punitive route possible. There are plenty of other districts that are not forcing children in New Jersey to um, sit and stare during a makeup day and miss instructional time. That is not the intent of the board of the State Department of Ed policy. So that's, that's specifically what I'm talking about, not sure. whether it's okay for a kid to refuse a test. Right. And, and as I said, the, the Department of Education actually has made no statement um, officially about that. Mm -hmm. There was an email from one person who, when I spoke to that person on the phone, said basically, you, you can't do it. You can't even really have the discussion about opting out. And so, you know, there's, a, as what I, I mean. What do you do for the fall? Because these tests are, they're coming, they're coming, you know. There are going to be, my guess is there are going to be more families opting their kids out. I don't think we as a district want to put our heads in the sand and say, well, this shouldn't be happening. It's, it's a reality. So what, what are you as a board going to do with this reality? I think that we'll, we'll look at, you know, whether there's any guidance from the Department of Education. And if there isn't, you know, certainly we can try to figure out uh, a reasonable way to deal with the problem within the confines of, you know, within the parameters of the regulation and within the official word that's given from the executive county superintendent and the uh, office of assessment. Okay, it, and I, I just want to say that, I mean, I went to some hearings in Trenton <clears throat> that the State Department of Education had, and I spoke um, as a teacher, as a, as a teacher of children with special needs in another district, as you know and talked about the um, high stakes testing and my perspective on it. Um, I didn't see anybody from Highland Park there as much as the former board chairman told us, we, you, we need to lobby Trenton. I'm not seeing anyone. I know, um, Ms. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Chimarusti. I know she has been there in the past, but I don't see any of you there. And it was disappointing to me because that was an opportunity you know, you did your resolution, but it, it comes across really as, as shallow or not meaningful when you don't then take the step to show up and really try to make a difference. My experience talking to the State Board of Ed was much more pleasant than my experience talking to this Board of Ed. They actually, I felt like they were listening, and they actually asked respectful follow-up questions, which is, is not always the case when I talk to this Board of Ed. But anyway, I hope you will take seriously the fact that there will be more parents opting out their kids. I'm sure of it. Um, and, and you need to come up with a policy that's real. Thanks. Thank you. One thing that I would suggest that we do is, I mean, clearly the state, the state policy is you can't opt out, but we can look at how other districts across the state have handled similar situations. And there's been a range. There have been other districts that say your kid has to stay home. There have been other districts that say your kid can come, but they're going to sit and stare. There are other districts that say your kid can come, but then they can go to the library. There are other districts that say, so districts take that same mandate and then they interpret that 
as they will. So I think we can keep going to the state, but it's kind of doubtful even between now and the next testing cycle that the state is going to come out with any statement different than everybody has to take the test. But we all know the reality is everybody's not going to take the test. So I would suggest at the board level, we reach out to other boards, we reach out to other districts, we can, instead of continuing to beat our heads up against the state wall, and see what other districts have done, see if there are any punitive consequences for that. So far, I've yet to hear of any district that has received any punitive consequences for either numbers of kids opting out or for their method of handling kids who opt out. And then we can look and see what then as a board resonates for us in terms of our comfort level. I don't know that we're all comfortable with students sitting and staring. I'm personally not comfortable with students sitting and staring. So I would like us to have a more broad kind of overarching conversation than the state says no. Bobby David Kumar, Cedar Avenue. I just had a couple of quick questions. Uh, I think some of them may just be explanations. Um, so I think the first one was in um, item C1 of personnel communications. I think by and large, I think I can generally sort of follow the, the board agenda, but I guess if you could explain what this, what this item is exactly, what that means, which is the, uh, it's the one that outlines the memorandum of agreement um, between the Highland Park Administrator the board, Association. Do you want me to? Yeah. The board um, met with, and uh, actually, the the negotiating committee of the board met with and um, and made an agreement with the administrators' association. Okay. And so we're ratifying that contract. Or okay, great. Um, and in terms of the um, Michelle Callis's position as the assistant superintendent, is that position going to be replaced? I know you'd mentioned something, Dan, about it's um, advertised as a supervisor position, supervisor of curriculum right now. Um, it has not yet been filled, and so if there's no, you know, if there aren't any really great candidates, then you know the board will have a discussion with the administration about possibly putting the curriculum duties uh, with the principals, you know, for a time if needed. Okay, and then is there anything that's required that has to be in terms of, I guess, Israel Soto's um, sort of increase or, or the change? I mean, it looks like we're just moving from an assistant superintendent to potentially a supervisor. Do you have to send like a revised budget to the executive county superintendent or anything like that? Is there a revised budget that speaks to some of the, the changes um, around this? I don't believe so. You uh, no, the budget is um, finalized in April and then as it operationally we make adjustments as the year goes on. The only time we need to report to the county superintendent is if uh, specific categories um, go above a uh, change of 10% of the total budget in certain categories. Uh, that rule doesn't, it does not apply across the board. It's, it's specifically, uh, requ sort of specific requirements regarding that. Most, most likely, no changes we make would, would hit any thresholds which would require us to make uh, reporting to the county. We haven't needed to do that in years. Okay. And so on, the, on my last question, which is a follow-up to Dr. Krieger's questions, uh, which was on the, uh, the program for the English language learners and the sheltered instruction, um, I guess if the board, um, and I guess this is probably particularly for the curriculum committee, um, I guess how do you envision the program working? I guess maybe it would be helpful for us to understand um, what your understanding of the program is and, and what it means and how it's going to operate. And I guess maybe as a follow-up to, in addition to how many students um, in a particular grade are English language learners, um, you know, the number of languages that are generally spoken, I mean, not the exact number, but a general ballpark, but if you could walk us through a little bit about what that explanation is or, or how it was decided upon that this was going to be the right direction. Um, I, would, I would have to um, defer that till the next board meeting. I think okay. there's a, a lot of research required in terms of, or some research required in terms of the numbers. Um, I will say that the, and I think Dan corrected it at the end of the last statement, it's not that everyone's being lumped into one class together, there's a certain threshold. Um, that was my understanding, um, but we'll provide clarity around that at the next board meeting. Okay, so I guess my specific, so if there's about 22 kids in a classroom, kindergarten, and there's roughly, call it 10% of the population that's English language learners, you know, you'll automatically hit that threshold anyway, 50%, just by how many kids we have. 
I guess so maybe for the next follow-up board meeting as a follow-up to Dr. Krieger's questions, you know, if, is the idea that even if it's less than 50%, to always group those kids together um, would really be my specific question. So, you know, maybe at the next meeting with the follow-up. Absolutely. Be and I think that the overarching, I mean, perspective on it is, and the, this is my understanding and I'm not an ELL expert, um, is that the services can provi be provided um, when students are clustered and not that there would be, you know, 20 kids who are English language learners in a, you know, in a general mainstream, let's say, English language arts class, but that the services can be provided to those students um, because, they're, because they are clustered together. Um, and much in the same way, I think that special education is done where you can have, a, it's a 50-50 threshold, um, there's up to nine students in an ICR section, you know, those types of things. Now, I mean, again, I'm not an ELL expert, and I, I don't, wouldn't want to say that, you know, this is exactly what the vision for it is. Um, and so I think we'll, you know, we'll take the questions and, uh, and have more information at the next meeting. And, uh, and how is that different than what's being done right now? Right now, is it push in or is it pull out? Or I guess I just, what's, the, what's being done now? The difference, I, I think, is that you, if you have five kids, they could be in five different classes. And then, so then to provide them each with services effectively is more challenging. That's, again, that's my understanding. So right now, the kids are, I mean, I, I took, I was an ESL student, so mm -hmm. I remember being pulled out, but obviously that was many years ago. So, so I guess right now, it's the kids come out of the classroom, but maybe this program is when the teacher comes in? Is that a general, is that kind of, sort of the plan? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I mean, I, mean, I, I uh, that's what I believe, but uh, again, okay. I'm not gonna say that that's exactly what the, Okay, yeah, that would be helpful for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So can we, we'll do a specific presentation about this for the next Yeah, I mean, meeting? I'll have, I have the questions that I need to ask, and so. Okay. Great, thanks, thank Bobby. you. Thanks, Bobby. Okay. There's no paper here. <laughs> Bobby, did you take the paper? Uh, Nora Krieger, 19 North 6. Did Bobby, did you take the paper? I need you, I need you to put it down, I'm sorry. I will, but <laughs> no. it's not here. Um, I'll write it down before I leave. Um, this PSYOP, which is a really good research program, it's recommended everywhere. It does re it require some cluster of students. You don't want one child, uh, usually. Although one child in a classroom will learn English very fast, one young child. But the question I have that I forgot about has to do with training. Usually the PSYOP program is, is administered or taught by an ESL teacher, someone who has a master's degree or a, definitely an endorsement in ESL. Um, I understand we don't have that. And the, what I had heard, and I hope I was wrong, is that we're going to try to turn classroom teachers into experts in three days of professional development before school starts. And that's a little scary, because it's not something that you can learn to do in three days, and certainly not learn to do it well. So when I come back the next time, I hope that'll be another issue that the superintendent will be able to answer. Thank you. And, and I don't believe it's true that we have, have we have no ELL teachers. What? I don't, I don't believe it's true that we have no, no ELL teachers. You said we have no certificated. No, ESL. ESL teachers are either have master's degrees or yeah. they have uh, endorsements. Uh, right, English language learners. But that, yeah. English language learners are in the classroom, and ESL yeah. teachers normally interact with them using the PSYOP model. My understanding is that the, the, the general education teacher is not the person that's going to be, going to be implemented. Well, how are they going to do it otherwise? Who's going to work with that group when, the, when they're learning content? Are they going to be pulled out? I understand there's no ESL teacher assigned to that school or they're being shared. No, they're... They're being shared. Hmm. And that's not going to work. Hmm. I can guarantee you that. Well, and isn't, I mean, if we have classrooms that are inclusion, they're generally classrooms with a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher in them. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it sounds like you're talking about the same kind of numbers of students in a classroom as you might have in an inclusion classroom, but not necessarily a team teaching model in those That's classes. the question, right, and I'll find out the answer because to that. It, 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 uh, how, I mean, I think that is a problem. We wouldn't, I don't think we have that many. ESL well, that's people. right, that's the, I think that's the question, yeah. There's no paper here. Did someone walk away with it? Did Bobby <laughs> took it? <laughs> I'm sorry.
Thank you, Nora. Is there any other public comment? Hi, I apologize. I was at a swim meet, um, so I'm late. And um, I apologize if I'm going over old terrain. Just state your name, address. Dara Botfinick, 348 Becker Street. Um, I just wanted some personal clarification on the benchmarking that you guys were so open to discussing. Um, and I believe that you, I, I was checking what was going on in the meeting, and I think I heard that they were not mandatory, um, or the idea was that they were minimized in a sense because there were five questions, one benchmark. If you could clarify for me, I apologize. What, what, I, what I stated, and this is the information that I was given, so, right. you know, Absolutely. Um, is that it's quarterly benchmarks with five questions that are benchmarked on each assessment. Not that there are 20 different assessments Right. That, are, that are being given. So my response to that is, it really is a time frame question. Like, you could have five questions that would take, and I've given these early in my career, that would take five days. Um, you know, so it's a question of time frame, mm -hmm. um, and how much time would be spent on benchmarking um, is um, one thing. Um, and then, is that still distinct from summatives? Because then what I'm understanding is that potentially speaking, you are asking, I'm saying in best case scenario, one summative one day in a block period or one single period, and one benchmark a second day, that's two days at the least a month that is being required in extra grading and extra thought. So I simply want like a reflective process and an understanding, because mm -hmm. my understanding is that people who have already written benchmarking do believe it's mandatory, yes. to my knowledge, right. right? So that it's mandatory, and I'm recommending, and hoping I'm keeping my job in this recommendation, that it, to some degree it be, I understand there has to be a supervisory measure, but I wonder if it could be up to teacher discretion at some level, how many of these wonderful assessments you're gonna use, because I'm sure some of them are excellent, but you might be in the middle of a very dynamic unit and not want to stop to do separate test prep or separate benchmarking of skill base versus you know, a dynamic integrative curriculum that we've just written. Right. So. My, my sense of, my, I mean, good, certainly good practice is that if you're giving quarterly exams, that takes the place of summative exams. And, and so, I mean, that That's, would be great. That would be my response as, a, as an educator. Mm -hmm. um, but I will, you know, and my understanding from reading what I was sent is that each of these benchmarks is meant to be given in a period. Um, or so the five questions would be handled within one block or two blocks? That's my question, yep. right? So that's just my follow-up in terms of time frame and the fact that we're trying to implement a very dynamic new curriculum, which sure. I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> Marianne Feinberg, two twenty Magnolia Street, Highland Park. Um, I have a question. Um, our old director of educational services, Candy Hegemule, um, handed in her resignation probably around May 1st, whatever the contract um, required, two months. Um, to my knowledge, there has not been a posting for director of educational services. We have an interim, but, and that was posted, but we've not seen, at least I've not seen a posting for the director, and I was wondering why. That's correct. Um, and I think it, the uh, decision to have someone put in place um, immediately uh, upon Candy's release right. was really imperative. And I think that you know, the, this person was recommended by Candy. Um, he's someone who the administration believes is very competent, and I think that when the time comes, that posting will become permanent. I'm not sure whether that's the administration is planning that that posting become 
uh, open, you know, by January or by June, but... Well, it's just interesting because um, many of the other positions, whether they were assistant principals or principals, they seem to be posted right away. So, um, you know, it's the middle of July almost, and the beginning of the school year, uh, you had a, a big spread of time that you could have put somebody, or at least certainly looked at people, and interviewed people for a possible position that could have been in place in September, which to me would have been an ideal situation. But, um, and another question, or not a question, but I guess a, a comment um, going back to um, Mr. Soto's increase in pay and your reasoning for that increase, um, his added duties and so on and so forth. Um, I just wondered if anybody ever stops and looks in the offices and looks at the secretaries and looks at uh, the administrative assistants and our para-clerical positions who take on probably more than some of the um, some of the other people in our departments and in our district. And when we were going through a lot of turmoil and still are going through turmoil in offices, um, they were in charge. They were in control. They were your principal, they were your directors. They continue to be many times your directors, your principals, your superintendents, your assistant superintendents. Look at their salaries and look at what they get compared to Mr. Soto. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to say something positive. Um, I had the opportunity to meet, um, I believe his name is pronounced Shalala, the interim director of special ed. I had the um, privilege of going with a parent um, to be her advocate. I'm involved with CPAC. And um, I was really, I, I mean, we didn't agree on everything, which I didn't, you know, wouldn't expect, but he, he's, he, I think he's a really solid choice. I asked him, how long are you here for, if this helps the conversation, and he said, I, what I remember him saying was it was a year and could be extended for two years. So I got the sense it was, um, you know, the district's going to a new, um, I can't think of the word, software system for doing IEPs. They're going to, which is the system I'm familiar with is IEP Direct. That requires a lot of training, a lot of transition for staff. And he was, I got the sense he was going to guide staff through that, that the new system would be online, you know, starting in January, so that's a transition thing. So I think that at least the image, the, or the um, impression was that, the vision, excuse me, the vision was that he was going to stay on for about a year. Um, with all respect, I'm really not being sarcastic, but I, it would be great if Ms. I, there's so much interest in the community and understandably um, about what's going on with the curriculum and I is there any way Ms. Callis could come to a board meeting and, and you know just she's she sounds like I know she's on her way out the door but she's making all these important decisions and it, you know if the community could have an opportunity to actually I appreciate I may feel sort of bad for you that you're trying to go get information and communicate it to us I've never, I don't think she's been to a board meeting. I could be wrong, but um, that would be really helpful and it would be less of a pain in the neck for you to have to go running back and forth. I know she's going out the door, but it's just a suggestion. Because um, I do think people are, you know, they're interested in what's going on with the curriculum. There's a lot of changes, so that was just a suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Is there any other public comment? Okay, uh, at this time we need a res resolution to go into executive session at 6.30 p.m. on August 25th, 2014 at Bartle School to, to discuss personnel, litigation, and negotiations. Second. Someone has to move it first. Oh, move, uh, so, so moved. So Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you everyone for coming. Second, 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 second.